Welcome to The Independent. I'm Pete Sampson, back at my hotel in Dublin after Notre Dame's 42-3 thrashing of Navy. The only thing that was inefficient tonight was the cab situation outside of Viva Stadium as I walked, I think, almost two miles back to my hotel to record this podcast. Matt, um, you had no such travel issues being at home in Chicago, so I I know what I saw. I know what I felt as I watched uh, Sam Hartman throw four touchdown passes in his debut. Um, the defense pitch, which would have what would have been a <laughs> shutout against anyone other than Brian Newberry or Dino Babers. Dino Babers, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was um, it was a performance that I don't want to get too carried away with. It's week zero, but it does, and I think Navy is quite bad. However, it raises the ceiling of what I think Notre Dame might be this season. Yeah, Sam Hartman, uh, today alone, wore his own rib on his neck, ran around post game with a shillelagh that looked like it was from like the 16th century, and he lifted a glass trophy all within like a few minutes span. I'd say that was a I good I think the day glass trophy overseas. actually got left in the interview room after uh, post game, which I, f- I found strange. <laughs> oh, okay. They'll, they'll have uh, our friend John Anthony will we'll bring it back with him for them, yeah. I think, on his trip back to, to South Bend. Um, yeah, it was like, You tweeted this. You just said it. It's week zero, right? There are overreactions to everything. Uh, The last team that won in Ireland last year still has not won a game since then in Northwestern. So I I don't want to go too crazy with this. However, it was flawless. Like, you you thought Sam Hartman would throw for a lot of yards. You thought this offense would be able to run the ball. You thought they'd do a lot of the things they did. But the fact that they were able to do it pretty much at will. I mean, they did not punt the whole game. The only time they did not score is when they missed a chip shot field goal. Uh, they The offensive uh, operation, especially for a first game with a new offense coordinator, w- was really, really efficient. And, and that being said, I might be even more impressed with what the defense did because that's not an easy offense to prepare for. I think especially late in the game when the game's been well put away, um, it's easy to get gashed for a big gain or two or, or get sloppy and, uh, you know, allow some points on the board you shouldn't have i'm not talking about a field goal <laughs> with three minutes left um I, I thought for both coordinators today those are a plus performances uh, for the defensive side not a whole lot you could take to translate to next week and the rest of the season but for the offensive side i'm with you it, it definitely crystallizes the picture of what this Notre Dame team can be because when you go into every game uh, and right as of right now the only one might be USC where you think you've got the best quarterback on the field. Um, you, you think you're going to win. And, and rarely have we been able to say that about Notre Dame on a consistent basis week to week. No, I mean, it's Hartman finishes 19 to 23 for 251, four touchdowns. Uh, other Notre Dame quarterbacks who threw four touchdowns in a debut, Ron Paulus and Jack Cohn. Uh, I feel like Sam Hartman's should get people more excited than either of those. Although, you know, the, the obviously the hyper on Ron Paulus was something else. But they outgained Navy 444 to 169. Um, and really, it's like you look at Hartman's incompletions. One was a drop from Tobias Merriweather. One was a 50-50 ball that Tobias Merriweather couldn't go up and get. It looked like it was called a PI, then it wasn't. Um one was a, just a bad throw by Hartman that almost got picked off to Chris Tyree, and the other one was sort of like an improvisational Brett Favre flip to, I think, Jabron Payne uh, when he was rolling out of the pocket. But some of the stuff tonight, uh, the third and 12, 22-yard screen to Audrey Custeman on the first drive, I loved. Like That's the kind of throw and call that if Tommy Reese had done it, we would be like, oh, Love it. Great call. And the third I'm down before sure. that, they ran on third and 10. And at first I'm like, yeah, what are you doing? And like, oh, nope, easy. <laughs> I'm like, it's some of the, I had Jared Parker had a really nice night, not just like from an operational standpoint, but from a schematic and a, a play calling standpoint. But then the, the play to me that summed up that Sam Hartman is essentially is the old man in YMC basketball who you think is like, whatever. And then he scores 35 points. And you're like, what the hell just happened? was Navy sends pressure up the middle. Sam Hartman's rolling left. He escapes from it. Navy busts the coverage. And he just whips the pass into Jaden Greyhouse, who was his second touchdown of the night. That, like, when I watch Sam Hartman play, and even when I watch him behave after the game in his press conference, which was, like, 
a little strange. Like it's the first post game press conference at Notre Dame. Maybe he's always like this, where he thanks his offensive line at the start of every answer. Um, he thanks both athletic directors. That's got to be rare because rarely wait, wait, both both think... of Notre Dame's athletic directors are Navy's yeah both Notre of Notre Dame's Dame. athletic okay. directors. I don't think he ever ran into that at Wake Forest. So he's thanking Jack Swarbrick and Pete Babakwa, thanking Katie Lonergan, uh, athletic communications head. Um, didn't get to thanking the media, but it was just like you felt like Notre Dame has a full grown man at quarterback. And even the way he interacted with Marcus Freeman, which is sort of the lead for my follow up on the athletic now is Marcus Freeman finishes up with his post game press conference. He gets up, he sees, Oh, Sam Hartman standing there. And I think he says, Oh, I didn't know that you were here. Uh, in a, in a deferential, like, I'm sorry, I was making you waste time and wait to talk. Um, I'm the, I know I'm the head coach at Notre Dame, but like you're the story tonight. Um, it just feels like, and I, I asked Brian Newberry, uh, Navy's head coach about this, just ab- about that play that I referenced the second touchdown to Greyhouse. And he's just like, we have pressure. He spins out of it. And he's like, he is like a coach on the field. And that's true. But I also feel like he's a grown ass man out there. And I mean, Notre Dame has not had that at quarterback in a long, long time, maybe like late era Brady Quinn or something. Like even when Ian Book was old, I don't think you ever felt like, not never, you often did not feel like he was the reason Notre Dame was going to or just had won the game. Whereas with Sam Hartman and like Notre Dame did a bunch of good stuff and we will get into all, you know, you mentioned the defense. It's all true. Young players played. It was good. But Sam Hartman, that's that's the reason I feel like Notre Dame's ceiling just went up because when he's playing like this, that's when the NC State, Pitt, Louisville, Duke games become really hard for NC State, Pitt, Louisville, and Duke because Sam Hartman is at the controls of what can be a very efficient offense. So that's that, I think, is my biggest takeaway is it looks like Notre Dame has a man playing the quarterback position right now in a way that they have not in a long time. He lost to two of those three teams last year, so I'm going to like put pump the brakes Fair. just a little bit Fair because point. I don't. But it's like, like the Fisher Alt combo, like the holes that Audric Estimate, like, and I get it. Navy is is bad, like capital yeah. B bad, but I just think like if Hartman, I mean, he doesn't need to play A plus. He can play B B minus, and I think they should win those games because of the talent they have at the other positions. Um, but if he's on it, like this, right. this is why. Notre Dame has a puncher's chance against Ohio State in USC in Clemson. M- more in two than of those that, games, yeah. like you reference, Notre Dame will have the better quarterback. Maybe he can outplay Caleb Williams. We'll see. But um, I mean, look, Drew Pine outplayed Drake May last year. If you want to get technical about it, um, but Sam Hartman, it just it just raises the ceiling on what Notre Dame can be. You know, it's funny. I, I went on uh, radio shows actually this morning with our friend Adam Ritterberg on ESPN and. It, we were talking about Hartman. I said, you know what? It, it kind of dawned on me right now. He's probably the second most accomplished active player in college football. Like number one's got to be Caleb. He has a Heisman trophy and he's still yeah. playing, but like you saw it in the press box with your own two eyes. We all heard it on the broadcast, every single touchdown he threw no Eagle. And he just passed Colt McCoy for 18th on the altar. Or what, you know, it was every single yeah. play and he Derek made Carr was another, passing, right. right. It was another milestone. And you mentioned the words grown ass man. I mean, Daniel Jeremiah of, uh, I believe the NFL network uh, tweeted uh, Notre Dame starting quarterback today is three years older than the starting quarterback in the Indianapolis Colts. So yeah, I mean, grown ass man is, is appropriate. He also has, I mean, I, I, not that we didn't know this and we'll try not to harp on it too much on this show. He has such a great head of hair. Like, I don't know if we can allow him on here. If, if, if we get him like it, it's, he is a really good head of hair. Um, and he didn't look like he broke a sweat today. I think that was like when you look at takeaways, yeah. like he is a dual threat mobile quarterback who did not carry the ball once today. Like, don't overlook That's that when when point. you look yeah. at like not once did he even feel like, ah, you know what? I'm tired of going through the progressions. I'm just gonna put my head down and pick up four or five yards here. Like, not once. Like, I don't even know if that thought crossed his mind watching that game on TV today because he just, even the, the was it the third touchdown pass, I think, um, to Great House? Third yeah, second. The, the second one to Great House, but it was his third on the night third, where he right. rolls left. And it looks like, I mean, he could have taken off and he's like, right. yeah, I'm going to throw it three quarters, boom, whiffed it into the end zone where maybe he had busted a coverage and Great House is there to catch it. Yeah, it's it was it was very, very impressive. Um, 
it, it was, uh, I, I will say, uh, as a viewer, not the smoothest broadcast operation. That was a very shaky camera pregame and postgame. Uh, it, it was it was not very easy on the eyes. Thought No Eagle did a very good job uh, on the broadcast. Uh, he'll be NBC's main guy on the NB on the Big Ten, I guess, Saturday night games moving forward. Uh, also, they did a nice segment on J.D. Bertrand's father having lived in Ireland and being on the front cover of the Irish Independent. So maybe there's room for him on the oh. American Independent later on. This <laughs> uh, I also love the fire in the end zones on the touchdowns. Could they get that uh, in their name? Like they the, had a lot. That was great. I the the pomp and circumstance uh, tonight was impressive. Like there was a lot of fire. Um, there were fireworks before the game, and the flyover was like legit terrifying. Um, I think there were ospreys is what they were. Um, like where the they're like helicopter planes where like the propellers turn and everything like and they were low and there were three of them um so well done like dublin overall they killed it with this um i don't have a lot of recollections of the game 11 years ago just other than like it was fun and like people seemed into it but uh very gracious host city um as much as I would like to see Notre Dame take this show on the road internationally, I would understand if they returned to Dublin just based on how much people seemed into it. But um, yeah, I, let's get into the defense a little bit because they, I thought that it, I thought it was a real example of like the marriage of Al Golden, who can sometimes do too much defensively. But when you marry that to Leofau, Kaiser, Bertrand, it's really hard to do too much defensively because your linebackers can give you a little bit of everything uh, or a lot bit of everything. Like they play Kaiser as a safety. Sometimes he lined up at almost like a cornerback position. He finished with a game high eight tackles should have had a fumble recovery um, that got ruled. That, Cause I guess I, I, I couldn't tell either way, but the way they're able the to camera rule angles so quickly, are awful. camera angles awful. The, the, the paint was awful. Like the one, the first fumble recovery that wasn't, when you watch replay, it looked like he was in bounds, but that was because you literally couldn't see the faded, you know, sidelines on TV. The second one, it was just like Navy's ball. We're going to guess here and we're going to stick with it. Like yeah. there was no, I'm like, okay, if you say so, like, I'm not saying it wasn't yeah. Navy's, but I saw absolutely no evidence either way whose ball it was. Also like, sounds good in theory that like the clock's going to run after the first down and uh, the game's going to go fast and yada, yada, yada. Uh, not, they're just going to add, unnecessary replays to every single play and get your commercials in like that, that right. as a whole it felt yeah, like any other quarter it seemed like oh we got to make some money off this game uh let's slow this down a little bit uh, joe montana the- you look sober enough come on down for a yeah, sideline interview half was just like <laughs> rapid fire um but yeah you know, defensively what anytime notre dame plays the option well you're you are killing the fullback and it's if you do that and you take out the quarterback, essentially you have nothing left to work with there. Navy's two lead fullbacks, they finish with 22 carries for 70 yards. They each had one run of, I think, 10 yards or more. The rest of it was just nothing going. Ty Lavatai, the quarterback, 10 carries, 23 yards. Nothing for him at all. Uh, Basically banged him up and knocked him out of the game for for a minute. Hey, he it had was. receivers open on the two times he threw. Yeah, he it's like either time. <laughs> yeah, and like well, Jack Kaiser got pressure on the first one, right. um, where I, I think Cam Patalo on the and second one. JD Bertrand were um, sort of caught a step slow. That, but it's like that works, and like people on Twitter were kind of getting at me of like, "Oh, the defense hasn't stopped them; they dropped the ball." It's like if you get Navy into What's, a fourth yeah. and plus three, like you did your job. Uh, and then if you get pressure and make the like that would they be weren't hard clean throw. plays like they were open but they weren't clean plays it's not like no a, like, that would have been a hard <laughs> throw if he was just in a clean pocket right uh, which he wasn't so i thought Notre Dame's defense played really well from the start it uh maris leofile after the game talked about how navy came out in formations that they had actually never practiced against which is saying something because Notre Dame was practicing against navy stuff and kenesaw state stuff and I could be wrong on this, but I I believe that in the first drive, uh, you know, when Navy had Notre Dame kind of figuring things out a little bit, 
they hit the fullback run for 14 yards and the fullback run for 11 yards. Those were both uh, runs by Fafana. That was kind of it. Um, you know, he that was, what, 25 of... I Navy. did not expect a shutout after no, those first two I mean, drives. Let me put it that way. From there, I those think first he, two Navy his, drives. his next 14 carries, I think, went for... 15 yards, seven yards. I don't know. It's um, almost nothing. So once you take that away from Navy and I mean, some of that is physicality, some of that is talent, a lot of that is scheme. I think you have to give Al Golden a lot of credit for like getting the right scheme in place. And then you have to give the the linebackers in particular credit for executing it. Um, Cause when you, when the team is throwing funky kind of junk formation at you, it's hard to get adjusted, but they got adjusted real quick. Um, it would have been Navy the first time Notre Dame had shut out Navy since 98, which I think was four years before Paul Johnson even showed up uh, as head coach. So to do that, um, which in, in spirit, they did shut them out. Um, I don't acknowledge the field goal that was kicked uh, by the midshipmen um, due to the the lack of cojones involved. So it, uh, It was a hell of a defensive performance. That was, as much as I think Hartman probably travels moving forward, I don't know about the defense. Sure. Um, They did some good stuff, but I think Navy is bad. Um, They have a one-dimensional quarterback trying to play a two-dimensional offense, and it just did not work. 2.6 yards per rush for Navy, I think, is the story of the game. On that side of the ball, Notre Dame, conversely, four different players who average at least 5.2 yards per carry. I thought... Estimate 95 yards, one touchdown, that's great. The fact so many different guys, literally every time Sam Hartman turned around to hand the ball off, it could have been to any one of five guys, essentially. Um, Really impressive. Again, you're not going to be playing defenses like Navy's most of the season, but um, the way they were able to essentially establish themselves downhill from the get-go, I thought was very, very impressive. Matt, what have you always said is my biggest weakness on fall Saturdays? Well, Pete, I'd say your hair, but who am I to talk? Let's go with your wardrobe. Hmm, harsh but fair. As a friend and your co-host, let me tell you about the exclusive clothier of Notre Dame football, ESQ. ESQ outfits over 400 professional athletes, celebrities, Marcus Freeman, and Irish players on game day with bespoke clothing that elevates their game off the field. ESQ sculpts every garment with precision, helping you look your best for work, weddings, celebrations, or in your case, Pete, the press box. Listeners of The Independent can get 15% off their first online order by using the code IND15 at checkout. That's IND15, or visit them at their Chicago showroom for a full custom look. Head to esqclothing.com to create your perfect fit. The one takeaway player-wise, as far as like someone who was a mystery coming to this game for me is Jaden Greyhouse. I mean, we touched on this before they're going to need someone to step up in the receiver room. If they're going to make a serious push for a playoff berth this year, I couldn't tell you the last time they had that from a freshman. Um, you know, I mean the fact the broadcast was like and replacing Lorenzo Styles, who led them last year, it's like, oh yeah, that was their leader. And like Yeah, he was the lead barely... receiver right. if you once you take Mayer out of the equation. Right. Well, here here's one. I mean, I was looking at the depth charts and, and whatnot pregame. If you took away Chris Tyree, who is a receiver this year, but was not a receiver last year, um and you looked at just the starting receivers, the listed starting receivers on both teams, Navy's career receiver Navy's receivers for their career uh 23 catches for 346 yards two touchdowns Notre Dame's at 26 catches for 402 yards three touchdowns like Navy was almost right there with Notre Dame like Notre Dame had to move Chris Tyree for receiver help um now if you get these kind of performances uh from great house that, that that makes things a lot easier for you um I'd like to see something from Tobias Mayweather uh, after a game today. Um, I know he was banged up last year, but I thought he's a little too hyped coming to this year. I mean, not that Vegas yeah. is everything, but FanDuel had him for 43 yards on his over under today. And I'm like, he has one career catch for 41 yards. Like, not saying that can't happen because obviously, um, you know, Notre Dame had two players res- catch more yards, three players go for more yards than that today. Three players who hadn't done a whole lot in their career to this point. But 
I'd like to see him get more involved, but, but seeing Jaden Greyhouse, especially that first touchdown, was a little bit underthrown, and he he made a play on that ball um, where he yeah. essentially boxed out the defender. That's not something you're used to seeing from any freshman of that position at Notre Dame in a long, long time. No, and it's like, I think for freshman receivers, I'm, I am always a little bit skeptical of like, all right, your high school stats mean what exactly? You, you're, you're playing a run and shoot offense. Maybe, you know, maybe your quarterback is Kate Klubnik, um, right. which was the case for great house up until his senior year. Um, you know, he was, he was a big time prospect, but not like big, big time where you thought like, okay, everybody is in on this guy. Um, you know, some schools were making decisions on him. The guy had 4,000 career receiving yards in high school. Like it, he looked like a guy who done who who had four thousand thirty five career receiving yards in high school tonight. Um, he looked like a guy who had what one hundred fifteen, one hundred eighteen yards on eleven catches in the spring game. Like that's pretty easy to dismiss to dismiss as it's happening. Um, after tonight, it's not. And I'm not saying that he's going to be a number one receiver this year. I I still feel like Notre Dame's pass game is a lot of like. They have a collection of number two receivers. He was if one of a them entering today. <laughs> yeah, it's like, but if you have a quarterback like Sam Hartman, maybe that's okay because he because one of those number twos is always going to be open. If you pick the right number two, you're okay. You know, Jaden Thomas, Jaden Greyhouse, um, Chris Tyree. I mean, credit Deion Colsey for showing up tonight. Right. Um, his camp was similarly perplexing uh, as Tobias Merriweather, but in some ways, maybe less so because we feel like Tobias Merriweather has the higher ceiling. Uh, but Deion Colsey did some stuff tonight. Rico Flores got in the game. Um, Salerno got in there. So it's, um, I don't, you know, there was some thought like, oh, well, Notre Dame is elite up and down the offense. I don't feel that way. But at quarterback, they were what I thought they were going to, if not better. At running back, they were pretty much exactly what I thought they were going to be. Like, five guys with talent, but one who is like a war horse tight end was, you know, I think by design, not really a, a part of the pass game, but that is okay. Um, Cause when you put in your slot receiver, usually your second tight end comes out. Um, and I mean, their offensive line Spindler and Coogan at the guard positions. If you have, I, I really want to go back and when I rewatch the game, take a screenshot. There was a first half run by Audrick estimate right up the middle where I swear to God, he, it was an eight foot wide hole in the middle. Like he had a, almost a three yard hole to run through. Um, it turned into like a moderate game. When you're getting gashed like that up the middle, your guard play is great. And I mean, Jabron Payne did some good stuff tonight. Um, you know, Jadar- Jadarian Price's touchdown run was sort of up the middle. I think it veered to the left a little bit. Uh, they, the offensive line did really nice work tonight. Um, so I think that in, in a surprising performance, which I I thought that they would struggle a little bit on the ground, and they they really didn't at all. I, I didn't think they'd struggle, but I didn't think it would come as easy as it did for them. I mean, that, that like not taken away from what they did, but you watch every drive, and again, it was a it was a pick your score kind of game because they were able yeah. to do whatever they wanted physically. Um, I'm with you on all those valuations. I would say, what, but when the quarterback play is as high as it is and can be, when the offensive line play is as high as it is and can be, and when the running backs are uh, as deep and as fresh as these guys are, I, I think you can make it work with a, a subpar slash unproven group of receivers. Again, every championship team has those guys, those those number one playmakers on the outside, uh, but it's less of a concern for me as much as it can be after one game against Navy overseas as it is because of what everyone else did, because we saw a promise from great house and from Colsey, who we weren't sure what we were going to get out of. And, you know, nine different receivers catch the ball today or nine different players catch the ball today. Six of them are receivers. Again, to your point, no tight ends, probably by design. Um, I thought that was about as egalitarian uh, of an attack as, as you could possibly hope for in a game like this, where it probably would have been very easy to just, make that game go a lot quicker, get out of there unscathed and hop on your plane back to America. Yeah, no doubt. It, um, it was, yeah, the, the, the cleanliness of the operation. Um, I thought they, they showed some things like I'm trying to remember that there was a play toward the end of the game. 
uh, maybe it was a stay screen to the left. Like they, it seemed like I wish they had gotten Steve Angeli more work, but like the flow of the game, like he came in at the appropriate time, but then the game basically ended two seconds after he came in. It felt like, um, cause like maybe there's a the one time. Cause like, again, that game was over after the third drive. That was the yeah. one time where I know naturally like, all right, get the guys out of there. They want them to get hurt. Let's get some reps for the backups. Yeah. No, this is just like Marcus Freeman's not a veteran coach. Like he still has a lot to prove. Like he needs to go for that death blow. Like Sam Hartman came to Notre Dame to play football, not just to like kill a year before he goes to the draft. Like I was, I was actually perfectly fine. Okay. With them keeping the starters in as long as they did. Uh, it's football. Oh, I was week zero. Yeah, I was too. I, I was just saying like the, when Angeli came in the game, I thought he was that was going to lead to more work than it ultimately led to. Gotcha. Um, yeah, the, the problem was Navy had a 15 place, 62 yard drive that took eight minutes off the clock. Um, Scored points too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I it, well, after a timeout, I don't. Um, the, I, I, the camera angle on those field goals was horrible too. While we're at it, I mean, I could, well, I couldn't see. Uh, I couldn't really see from midfield up. About I was, I was about like eight rows above Noah Eagle and Jason Garrett, but. Um, did you see the it beer, was, uh, the beer snake that they made from the upper deck to the main concourse at the end of the game? No, it, no, uh, it, was, it was pretty cool. It was like right, you can see like the Notre Dame band walking into the tunnel post game, and like it, it was cool. It, it collapsed, but it was a good effort. You don't get that too much at college football games. You just don't. no, no, you don't. <laughs> um, yeah, it just it was. I thought that overall the. And Marcus Freeman referenced it after the game, like sort of week zero, new coordinator, new quarterback. You expect some operational issues did not happen tonight. Um, I think defensively you would expect Notre Dame to play well. They played better than well. Um, I, but do we know enough about the secondary? Probably not. Um, you know, it's like, I did Jade Mickey was physical and tackles. Um, Trying to get the guys that got beat, Cam Hart got beat once, but that was with JD Bertrand, and that throw got sort of offline because Jay uh, Jack Kaiser got pressure. Thomas Harper and Christian Gray got beat on the same play. Um, that was connected on, but um, that's not really. I, there's no, I don't think any great takeaways there, other than like we know Hart and Morrison are good. Mickey can play well. Um, they weren't in nickel a lot tonight. Like is are Clarence Lewis and Thomas Harper like legit nickels that can play against elite competition? I, I think probably so. Um, just not something that we saw tonight because Navy doesn't put you in nickel positions very often. So I would, I would say that you, you come out of this learning a lot more about the offense than you did the defense, but you feel good about both of them. And then special team, Spencer Schrader misses a field goal. There were some, you know, nothing really happened of note in the return game. The opening kickoff was short. Um, I'm not really sure if there's much to be taken away other than the yeah, fans it, chanting, it, block that kick on punts. And I'm like, uh, yeah, Brian Mason's not walking down the door, nor is Isaiah Foskey. No, but th there was ample opportunity on that last one in the end zone. Uh, not me, but uh, if you were an over better, you had a lot, a lot of opinions about special teams on both sides today. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> That was a bad beat. <laughs> when one team scores forty two points and you don't go over forty nine, that that's a tough one. That's that's a tough way to to go broke in week zero when it's still August. But uh, you, you'll take it if you're an Notre Dame fan. I also random stat uh, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but is telling about today. Navy had as many incomplete passes as Sam Hartman did, and if you know how few little Navy throws the ball, <laughs> you know that Whoa. speaks very very well for Sam Hartman. In Notre Dame's operation. Um, it was a good day all around. Uh, tell us about Dublin. I see you were drinking a Guinness during this. I mean, did you make it there? Did you over to Guinness? Joe Montana? I yeah, did. What'd you, what'd you I, know? did. I made it to the Guinness storehouse on Thursday, no, Friday. Um, oh, wait, I, you have, obviously your profile picture. I mean, was it right? Yes. <laughs> um, and they figured out a way to put my photo on a, the foamy head of a Guinness, which was yeah. fairly amazing. I learned how to pour a Guinness. I screwed that up, um, but I learned from my mistakes on the second time around. I just I kind of overflowed it. Um, You've been there yeah, before, right? To, to Guinness? No, I've never been there. Oh, before. really? It was, oh, it was crazy. They had like a new time. a new tour 
that they're trying to put online where it's like kind of more behind the scenes. You're actually going through the the plant and like where they're roasting the barley and like you see the different, uh, I guess, brew houses that they built over the course of, I think, what is it, 18, no, I'm sorry, 1759. Um, just like, yeah, the, the age of the place and how it was, it was essentially one time the front door to the city of Dublin um, was wild. And then, yeah, I spent some time with Joe Montana. Um, hopefully we'll get that audio on our midweek podcast next week. But um, yeah, it was, that was a fun conversation as somebody who grew up a 49ers fan. And he was like, well, where are you from? And I'm like, you did? Michigan. He, oh, Michigan. Just, and he's like, I assumed you were Lions because of Michigan. Yeah. No, he gave me a weird look. And I was like, it's probably because the Lions were terrible. And he laughed. Um, so yeah, no, that was, that was very cool. It's like, overall, I thought that the, the city did a phenomenal job, incredibly hospitable, other than the cab drivers post game uh, at midnight around Aviva Stadium, where you, you just could not get a car anywhere. But everything else about the city, I thought was phenomenal. Um, they did a really nice job. Like, people were into it. There was a lot of gratitude that Notre Dame and Navy were here. Um, you know, the weather was pretty much great. Um, rained a little bit pregame uh but in game was fine it's cool so yeah I'd... high marks high high marks you didn't come to the game in 2012 did you no but i have i've been to dublin and to the guinness storehouse before we went uh i want to say 2017 uh it's, it's cool it's really fun it's like that that scene um that was going viral pregame of like i think it was dame street Notre dame street where there were just fans like that felt like a friday when I was there, you know what I mean? Like everyone's out of work early, like the cops yeah. are in the street drinking with you. Like it was, it's just a fun, obviously drunk city. Uh, we did the Guinness storehouse. I don't remember if we got our faces, you know, on the beer, but we definitely um, went through the whole how to pour thing. And like, it will, you realize when you get back to the States, there's so few, and I'm not like the biggest Guinness guy in the world, but there's so few places here that actually know what they're doing when you're like, you could, right. you could just read on the bartender's face. If you order a Guinness here, and by the look on their face, you can tell they have no idea what they're doing. And you almost want to correct them, but we won't go there. Uh, <laughs> I, I was in Madison yesterday. I bought way too much about a cow to come back to. Uh, so it means I got to drink it. Um, but it's uh, no Dublin's fun. Uh, I'll be curious. Actually, now Florida State and Georgia Tech open there next year. Um, oh, wow. I will be curious what's next, though. Generally speaking, whether it's Notre Dame, college football, overseas. I know Big 12 wants to do something in Mexico City. It's not overseas, but it is foreign. Uh, yeah, I wonder, like, remember Notre Dame, I think Vanderbilt 2018 was very close to going to Rome. Like, I know there were talks about it. I don't know what actually happened. Um, yeah, that was definitely a deep conversation at that point. Like, that, that I think, probably would be the next one is – it was interesting on the on the way up to O'Hare to fly over here. I stopped by uh, Glenbard South High School to talk to Cam Williams, who's like a top fifty player, Notre Dame's commitment. I think he scored five touchdowns in his opening week game, uh, and he was sort of lamenting, like, "God, they get to do this sweet Dublin trip. Like, what's the next foreign tour?" And I, I Lambeau not Field. That it's the reason <laughs> you come to Notre Dame that you get an all expense all expenses paid seventy two hour trip abroad, but. I do think the players like it. I mean, it, it resonates with them. I think it hits with them. So um, let's get let's get Rome on the schedule, Bavacqua. Like you're uh, you're kind of on the clock now. Bavacqua, he, he's got valid end of his name, like me. I, I think we can. Yeah, we, we'd all be in agreement that would work. Actually, my I've been to Rome too, and my last night there, uh, we're walking back to hotel. It was like our honeymoon slash baby moon, and uh, my wife's like, Matt, turn around. There's like a dozen people wearing Notre Dame stuff behind us. And it was Muffin McGraw and the entire women's basketball team, which was on a foreign tour. So we got to see them there. Um, Former podcast guest. Th that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on a different podcast. Um, did you go dancing the way Devin Houston did? Because he uh, he looked like he was ready for Gaelic Park on the south side of Chicago. No, no, I didn't do any of that. Um, yeah, I think pretty much like the extent of my uh, – Dublin tours was a Guinness storehouse and I went to St. Patrick's today, um, which then I found out was not a Catholic church, like, uh, which, and I feel like I'm confident, uh, in father Nate Wills who told me that down on the field before the game. So, uh, very cool city. Um, they, they put on a really good show and I, I get why Notre Dame came back here, even though at the time I was like, yeah, shouldn't you like branch out a little bit? Like, no, I get it. 
I get it, I get it, I get it. And it was um, I like Aviva Stadium, even though maybe the camera angles are not great there if you're watching at home. But um, I was talking to uh, one of the, somebody in the announcing team. Uh, well, I guess I'll save their identity here, but I'll try like, to narrow it better. down. <laughs> yeah, this is like this is better than the home games because uh, yeah, you yeah. like. Well, I know you're well, central location. Considering considering there was only one one person from that team who made the trip to Dublin who would have been there to tell you this story, yeah. and I know yeah. where he sits at home games. I have a pretty good yeah. idea who you might be talking. Maybe about. that'd be obvious. So <laughs> it was, um, yeah, it was just like the entire operation over there. I thought was was very well done, and um, you yeah, know, it's like you want. I mean, you want to put on a good show for your fan base. Like I, I was shocked or surprised, or maybe I shouldn't have been about how many Northern fans actually do turn up to this kind of stuff. It felt like kind of a major bowl game for Notre Dame and like just another game for Navy, but um, the Notre Dame fan base really turned out for this, maybe similar to Vegas last year where this fan base gets excited about these kinds of trips. Um, so, I mean, you want to do it for your players but I think ultimately, you know, this is this is an advertisement for the u- university at large, and I think Notre Dame came off very well. Yeah, I, I um, I think we're all in agreement. Like this, the Vegas Shamrock Series last year was the coolest, at least to oh know, yeah, as far as unique uniqueness, opponent, everything. It was awesome, and that environment's obviously electric. Dublin's obviously really really cool. Be- maybe it was because it wasn't the first time, and because this was a rescheduled game from a few years ago. I don't. I'm not saying I had trouble getting up for it, but I just. I did not sense, at least in the off season, the excitement around this one that I expected. But it seeing kind of the up on me being over here, seeing the images online and on TV, it looked electric. Like it looked really, really cool. Yeah, no, it's people. People were excited. I mean, they did the little, uh, you know, pregame. You see everyone walking around with their harps and Guinnesses and Smittics, and you know, you, I feel like you can tell like how lubed up a crowd is when Sweet Caroline comes on. Like by the volume of the ba ba ba, you're not um, singing it sober. <laughs> no, but it's like when that comes on with 15 minutes before opening kickoff, and your fan base is belting it out like that's a good crowd, and they belted that out. Um, Those of us was... stateside forget it was a night game, so he had some yeah, time exactly. to get ready. <laughs> no, no, it was it was good. The, the entire stadium was was well put together. Um, they wasn't there like some hiccup last year where they like ran out of beer or couldn't sell beer or something like whatever there, there was, was free or there's free no it's free beer right oh free beer wasn't okay. one of the registers broken yeah so they okay, just made it, it free yeah yeah maybe that was scott, scott frost probably got in improved. got in that line before he decided to call it yeah. kick and cost it was and it like <laughs> it's the only stadium that i've covered games in where like sort of the press area is like literally just out with the fans like it there's not a lot of partitions um so you're like is someone gonna steal my laptop maybe um but also like people were on press row drinking beer and it was i think even pete sampson who else (laughs) yes that i i was stuck to water and and coffee but um yeah there was there was just a lot of uh, a lot of good vibes flowing around that stadium and it and look it's it's easy and you should enjoy that performance if you're a notre dame fan because it's your opening week week zero, week one, whatever, it just doesn't get a whole lot better than that. And like now, I mean, we joke about this, but like the week zero overreaction is a thing, but like, Hey, Notre Dame gets to enjoy that. Like that's, they're the only, I don't know what's going to go on with USC tonight and nobody will because it's on the PAC 12 network, (laughs) but like Notre Dame is really the only story in college football right now of any significance. And that's, that has some, uh, some value for the next week. Uh, did you run into any trouble uh, in Europe with the name The Independent, given our friend Trent Krim and whatever? I the did. Name of that nobody, uh, nobody, nobody brought that up. That's that's been like a Twitter only uh, reference. Um, that maybe we should come up with a is this an effing joke segment of the? We of the we, week. we need wigs. <laughs> yeah, we we need wigs. Like his hair is way too good to be on the show. So, uh, but it was it was good to hear from Notre Dame fans. Uh, let's see, Temple Bar Thursday night. Walking back from the Guinness House Friday, uh, walking, I think, over to St. Pat's Cathedral today, walking into the stadium, at the stadium, after the game, and at the hotel bar when I got the Guinness that I've long since finished. People like the Independent, Matt. Um, it was very uplifting to hear. I- I'm still, I 
still not over the fact you mentioned St. Patrick's Cathedral isn't actually a Catholic uh, so Catholic church. It's like learning James Conn is an Italian. I actually graduated St. Patrick's Cathedral in, in Manhattan at, at Xavier, which is, uh, man, that's not Catholic. That's crazy. Um, before we do get out of here, I want to say uh, rest in peace, Tony Roberts, uh, Navy yes. longtime sports information director, Scott Strassmeyer, tweeted out the news of his passing. I believe he was 95 years old. He was the Irish radio voice for 36 years, if I'm not mistaken. A lot of fans of a lot of different generations have a lot of good memories of hearing his voice call some uh, pretty epic Irish games over the years. So I definitely wanted to send our condolences to, to his loved ones and to Notre Dame fans who obviously are uh, affected by the news. Not sure if that, I mean, obviously word travels, not sure if they did anything pregame there or anything like that. Cause he was a Navy voice as well, I believe prior to mm. uh, Notre Dame as well. But um yeah, just unfortunate news to kick off the season with. Yeah, no, he was, uh, yeah, sort of like it's the Lindsey Nelson, like everyone knows that and Paul Horning, but I feel like you mentioned that just there's a generation of Notre Dame fans after that where Tony Roberts was that guy. Um, but wasn't he on, you know, her, didn't you do the podcast with Lou and Tim? I feel like when I first started the beat, he was a regular guest. You might be right with, on that. Um, on 24-7. Yeah, he was, I mean, he was doing stuff for a while. Um, yeah, and I think it's, yeah, I, I feel like he's had some, because he was before, what, Don Cricky maybe replaced him yeah, as, the, so. as a play-by-play voice. Um, yeah, I think that Roberts kind of, he was kind of from the school where Notre Dame football felt a little bit, and I, I say this in a good way, just like a little bit smaller. Mom and a pop. little bit more like mom and pop. Um, yeah. Not as like sort of corporate big, like nobody used the term brand back then. And I think that there's like kind of a romanticism of that time that uh, people associate with the, the voice of Tony Roberts. So that's, um, it's a, it's a, it's an important year in Notre Dame football. Um, and I think that voice sort of resonates with a lot of people. Um, you know, when you hear intros or outros of highlight packages, Tony right. Roberts is the voice that I feel like I associate with that kind of stuff. Same, same. Yeah. No, when I first started covering that team, they're, Again, it was a different time where the, the social media and YouTube stuff wasn't what it is now, but every in-house Notre Dame production began with voiceovers of his highlight reels from uh, from back in the day. Uh, what's your itinerary to get out of there, assuming you actually do come back, we get you back here, and you're in South Bend uh, for so week one, week, game two, week one? I have to head to the airport in about three and a half hours. Oh, wow. Um, so it's going to be a bit of an ugly night here. Connecting through London, leaving London, getting back into O'Hare around 7 p.m. Central, driving back to South Bend, assuming my car starts, which it died on the way to O'Hare on Thursday. That was not exciting at all. Um, so it was kind of a, an ominous start to the season that proved. Uh, no, hey, hey, I'm the co-host of The Independent. <laughs> yeah. Start my nope. car. No, the the uh, this plane's police were not impressed at all. Um, yeah. So they would not jump my car. I wave, uh, I think, jumper cables in the air for about an hour, 98 degree heat on Thursday afternoon until someone stopped or went, no, Wednesday afternoon until someone stopped uh, and then got out of there. But I will be flying back into O'Hare tomorrow. Um, so we will have a midweek show. Uh, I think we'll definitely have at least one guest. Uh, if Plus, hopefully, um, you know, some of the audio that I got from Joe Montana over the, over the weekend here in Dublin. So it was back at it. I mean, it's, um, I'm going to miss the week zero overreaction podcast because at next week, I, I, I really don't think we're going to be able to come away with a whole lot from Tennessee state. Um, but you know, if they stack another strong performance back to back with this, maybe we'll make you feel a little different going to NC state. We'll see. I didn't think we'd have a lot of takeaways off this one going into it, and we do. So there's never a dull moment. Week zero, this man. Program. It's a hundred percent of all takeaways came from this game. All, all overseas. All of it will translate and travel back stateside. I, I guess I have if their takeaways. It's what the hell is going to happen to Navy <laughs> this season? It was weird not seeing Ken Niamatalo on that sideline. I mean, you talk about a guy who's like synonymous with a program. At least if you're a Notre Dame fan, you're used to seeing him every year. Uh, that was different and weird, but hopefully for Navy's sake, this is a bumpy start to a, a promising new era. And for Notre Dame's sake, uh, this is indicative of what's to come uh, the rest of the season. So 
we'll get out of here on that. Uh, August 26th, where I am, probably August 27th, where you are, and you won't it be is. in your own bed till like what the 29th, I guess, at that rate. But good luck with that. I'll uh, I'll sit back here, have a few more spotted cows, and try to find a legal stream of the Pac-12 Network to watch more football tonight. <laughs> Good luck to you, Matt. I appreciate that. All right. Well, yeah, then we'll wrap up on that. You've been listening to our first post-game edition of The Independent. Um, and I think, like we said in our first show, we know you need this show. Um, because, I mean, maybe you don't you don't need it this time. You just, like, want to have – you want to confirm everything you thought you saw tonight with us. But uh, there will be times, I think, during the season where you need us to sort of, like, unpack some things and uh, – make it all make sense. But uh, in terms of making tonight make sense, Notre Dame might be really good. Um, their quarterback is definitely really good. And the one thing I felt confident in the season is that Notre Dame was going to be a very entertaining product. And they showed that tonight. I do think that will travel moving forward. Might always not, might not always look as good as it did tonight, but I think it will be consistently entertaining like it was. So it was a good, uh, good opening week. Notre Dame 42, Navy 3. It's the same Hartman show. Um, and we will be back next week with our midweek show. Episode 3 of The Independent. Thanks for being with us. Thank you.